So as we know, today is a very special day. It's very auspicious because it's the day that the Buddha was born, he was enlightened, and the Parinibbana of the Buddha. And so it's very auspicious for us to come together today to practice together, to hear the words of the Buddha, and to put some time to this. So the Mahasaropama Sutta that we're looking at today comes from the middle length discourses. And this is a teaching from the Buddha that encourages us to understand the benefits of leading the spiritual life with its path and practice, but also to be quite cautious about becoming intoxicated with the attainments, the benefits that come with leading the spiritual life. What we'll see from looking at this sutta is that when we become intoxicated, we will not fully develop. Instead, what happens is we become negligent. We start cultivating unwholesome state, even though the path that we're leading is wholesome. And we start veering off this right path, falling into decline, losing sight of the true goal. When we don't fully develop, we fall short and we might think, oh, this is enough or this is good. Like there's some sukha that, that makes you forget about the, the permanent kind of sukha, the, the supreme safety that we're truly aiming for. Or we think that we can sustain these little attainments and knowingly or unknowingly, we, we think this is it. And we, we don't think that this can happen to us, particularly if one's mindset is I'm not good enough or oh, there's still a long way to go. But sometimes these things can be quite insidious as we shall see from our session today. So I'd like to start the session with a short meditation to lift the mind. Across the world right now, as we all know, wherever we are sitting, there seems to be so much turbulence, increasing challenges, a lot of distress, a lot of anger, a lot of violence coming up. And there are times when even we feel affected by this, even though we do all the right things, not looking at things and not getting involved. But there are times where we too, if we're very honest, we get unsettled and we even get shaken by what we what we encounter in these external conditions. So even though it's difficult, the reflection is really that we are ever so fortunate to take refuge in the triple gem. One of the sayings of the Buddha from the Dhammapada is, one who takes refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha, sees with right wisdom the Four Noble Truths. So suffering, the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering, the Noble Eightfold Path, leading to the cessation of suffering. This is the safe refuge, the supreme refuge. And we come to this refuge, one is truly free from all suffering. So as the external world faces more challenges, we can reflect in our meditation to start with about this rare opportunity that we have, this precious human life, this opportunity to learn and practice the Buddha's teaching to full liberation, to the complete ending of all suffering. And in the meditation that we begin with, think about how fortunate we are to live at a time where the Buddha's teachings are still available to us, that he has taught us his handful of leaves, which is more than sufficient for us to realize the truth and to develop this noble eightfold path. So let's meditate just for a few minutes with heartfelt gratitude to the Buddha. He's the first and foremost, our teacher, and heartfelt gratitude to the noble Dhamma. And of course, heartfelt gratitude to the noble Sangha, all the noble ones who have walked before us, following the Buddha's wise words, shining the light of wisdom so that we may know and see. So let's do a short little meditation. Teruan Saranai.
Okay, we can come out of the meditation. So something just to lift our minds, just to step out of, out of the world. So what we're going to cover today is run through our usual tips and reminders so we get the most out of this Dhamma session. We're going to look at why the Buddha taught the spiritual life. So examine different references of the Buddha, at what he said about the purpose of teaching the Dhamma. And then we'll look at the background and context to this sutta that we're studying today, the Mahasarupana Sutta. We'll also look at within that context, the architecture of the sutta, some of the key Pali words, and why the Buddha uses this simile of the heartwood. We'll also map in the higher training. So when we train in higher virtue, higher concentration, higher wisdom, and also the Noble Eightfold Path is within that training. So we can map the benefits to the higher training to see how it fits with our spiritual development. It offers a bit more clarity. And then we also look at what enables us to develop to fullness because when we meditate, it's all about development. Bhavana is all about development. So what we're trying to do is to develop to fullness. And then, of course, we'll deep dive into each of the different elements the different benefits within the simile of the heart would we'll go one by one and we'll do some meditation today on each of those now after that we'll have time for questions and answers we may not finish the full sutta today or we may not meditate on each aspect of the the sutta today we'll see how we go our main objective is really to hear the buddha's words connect with the dhamma in which, whatever way that we can and to practice together so even if we don't finish the sutta, that's okay. So our tips and reminders, as usual, keep, a, keep an open mind and be okay with not understanding everything. There may be different aspects that, that appear that are, are not, not for us right now. Also, we are learners. We are attempting to connect with the Buddha's teaching in whatever way that we can. And we'll be doing some meditation. So again, apply yourself to the meditation and use whatever examples that help you to connect with the Dhamma. So I will, of course, offer some examples as we go through. But when we do the meditation, bring up the ones that are very present for you. And then you'll be able to see that for yourself. And of course, let's have good wishes for everyone in the world and good wishes for everyone who is participating today. And of course, everyone that helps us to be here today. So let's begin with looking at this particular sutta, the Brahmacharya Sutta. This is in Anguttanikaya, chapter 4, discourse number 25. This is one of the suttas where the Buddha talks about the spiritual life and why he taught the spiritual life, why he taught the Dhamma. So it says, this spiritual life is not lived for the sake of deceiving people and cajoling them, nor for the benefit of gain, honor, and praise, nor for the benefit of winning in debates, nor with the thought, let the people know me thus. But rather, this spiritual life is lived for the sake of restraint, abandoning, dispassion, and cessation. The Blessed One taught the spiritual life not based on tradition, culminating in Nibbana, live for the sake of restraint and abandoning. This is the path of the great beings, the path followed by the great seers, those who practice it as taught by the Buddha, acting upon the teacher's guidance, will make an end of suffering. So it's very clear that the Buddha is saying that we, we don't cultivate it to deceive people or cajole or for any gain, honor, and praise, nor to win debates or even to create a sense of self out of it. There's another similar sutta, which is in the Itibhutika. It's called the Dutya Janana Kuhana Sutta. In this one, the Buddha talks about the spiritual life being lived for the sake of direct knowledge and full understanding. So again, what is most clear about the words of the Buddha in both those suttas is that we don't come to the Buddha's teaching in order to become hypocrites, you know, fraudsters in leading this life. We don't come for material worldly things, although they may come to us as, as a benefit. 
we don't come to this path to cultivate unwholesome states. If anything, we're trying to rid ourselves of them, abandon them. So we don't want to breed more defilements. And we certainly don't come to this path to get into arguments with people or to try and win, you know, dumber debates and, and then feel superior. And of course, we don't come to this path to create a stronger sense of self, atta, you know, become a spiritual self, a dumber self that we show to the world and ask people to respect us and give some benefit. I mean, certain things come to us because of the purity of the practice. But if we fall for some of these things, then that's not what the spiritual life is about. So this is part of the context for even the Mahasaropama Sutta. We come to the path purely because we heard something in the Buddha's words. It directly connected us to the Four Noble Truths, particularly the first noble truth of suffering. We come to understand why this is a noble truth, that when we come to birth, our predicament has been set. We are subject to aging and death and the whole mass of suffering. So no matter what we do, even the little bit of pleasures that we get, you know, they're fleeting, they become otherwise. That is where we connect and why we lead the spiritual life. And when we see that and apply ourselves to the Buddha's teaching, then what we want to do is go for the final goal, the true goal. Otherwise, we continue to be subject to the predicament this bigger predicament in all its different permutations, you know, transmigrating through sansara and being the owners and heirs of, of our karma. So our study of the Mahasaropama Sutta sits within this particular framework. Our goal is the permanent ending of all suffering. The way out is the development of the Noble Eightfold Path, the higher training. So we will come to understand today that there's these benefits. We're not denying that there's these benefits or blessings that come with leading the spiritual life, things that, that, that are the result of walking this path, things that are the proximate cause for development of the, of the path and further development of the path, things that will lead to awakening and will eventually lead to Nibbana. But those same things they can become the obstacles if we become intoxicated with them, if we start to cultivate the unwholesome side of it and fall negligent. And so we need to heed the Buddha's advice in the suttas and particularly the one that we're looking at today. And the other part of it is that it's really good to clarify what is the spiritual life? What are we developing it, it to? Sometimes we come to spiritual practice without really knowing you know, what is this development process that the, the Buddha talks about? We know the names of things, but we don't see it set out so clearly in our minds that there is a particular method of development, you know, through virtue, through concentration, through wisdom, and then just really seeing the truth. So today gives us an opportunity to clarify that in our own mind and then be able to really consciously practice that. So let's now go through the background and context of the Mahasaropama Sutta. So at the time, the Sutta begins with the Buddha. He's staying at Rajagaha on the mountain called Vulture's Peak. And this is where the, this particular teaching took place. So what it says in the Sutta, it was soon after Devadatta had left. So he had been suspended from the order of the Sangha. And we've spoken about Devadatta before. But to quickly recap, I guess, Devadatta was Buddha's cousin and brother-in-law, and he ordained and entered the Sangha, and he enjoyed a certain degree of gain, honor, and praise, particularly in the early stages of his monastic practice. But as a result of his jealousy towards the Buddha, he was suspected and he came known to be, he came, he came to be known uh, to have evil wishes. And the monks basically knew him for his lack of morality, his greediness, uh, his attempts to gain material requisites, uh, you know, wanting the honor, the respect, and, and I guess the pop popularity. And it was said that he had some supernormal powers, certain idis, but he became quite intoxicated with even that little bit of attainment, very proud and ambitious, and of course, envious towards the Buddha, which was something that he had for many lifetimes. And 
he wanted to be the head of the Sangha. So when he even had that thought, his limited iddhis uh, were said to have disappeared. So when Devadatta approached the Buddha and suggested that he become the head of the, the Sangha to be entrusted with the care of the, the order of the Sangha, the Buddha rejected that and rebuked him and so uh, even called him the swallower of other people's spittle. So he felt very aggrieved, very upset about that, and he vowed vengeance and he tried to kill the Buddha three times but failed, and he tried to cause a schism in the Sangha and eventually he, he himself, as well as his followers, eventually suffered. And so those that had followed Devadatta, they, they returned to the Buddha. So the teaching behind the Mahasarupa Masutta is really given with Devadatta in mind, offering us wise counsel about the dangers of getting intoxicated with the benefits and advantages that come with spiritual life. So in terms of the sutta architecture, it begins in the first paragraph with this kind of introduction. And then the next set of paragraphs go into the opening statement of why we come to the spiritual life. And then the Buddha explains four different challenges to the spiritual life and applies the simile of the, the heartwood. And then towards the end of the sutta, uh, paragraphs 10 to 11, the Buddha explains about one who isn't hindered by any of those obstacles and attains permanent liberation, nirvana. And then finally, the Buddha confirms that the true goal of spiritual life, the hard word, uh, the end is actually the unshakable deliverance of mind. So that's, that's the flow of the, the sutta. So when we look at this simile of the hard word, it's good to really look at the words and, and why the Buddha uses this simile. So sara or saro translates as the innermost, the hardest part of anything. And in terms of the tree, it's the heart or the core of the tree. Hence why we call it the heartwood. So when you look at that word, it also means substance, essence, the best part, the choicest part, also essential, most excellent, strong. And of course, when you look at it that way, it's of value, it's very worthwhile. And then upama is how we take it as a simile or a likeness or a parable example. So when you put that together, simile of the heart would. So the Buddha's teaching is very much about seeking out the most essential part, the most substantial and valuable part of spiritual life. And using the simile of the heart would, the Buddha is demonstrating what that is, you know, by going through the different parts of the tree that give us some benefit but not the heartwood, not the choices part. So heartwood is usually the center of the tree. So we can see that in the, in the diagram here. It's the center of the tree. And outside of that is the sapwood, and then you have the bark. So the heartwood, as has been said, it's supposed to be the best part. You know, it's, it's the one that is most dense, the, the strongest. And so when you make anything out of it, it is something that is very sturdy and it's the most sought after, the most expensive. So when we understand that, if we develop the spiritual path, our practice and our, our spiritual life in order to find the heart wood, then we are seeking out the strongest part, the most valuable part, the essence of spiritual life. So what we'll see in this sutta is that when we go for anything else, when we fall short and go for the twigs and the leaves, the inner bark, the outer bark, all of those things, we actually fall short of that. And so one of the other things to say about this teaching is that it's given to the monks. The Buddha gives his teaching to the monks. However, it's very applicable to lay disciples who have seen the truth, who wish to develop the super mundane path. So the noble eightfold path as the way out of the whole mass of suffering. So when you take up the higher training in virtue, concentration and mind, then this is something that is very applicable to lay people walking this path. So at the end of the sutta, so it's good to see what the Buddha says at the end of the sutta, almost like beginning with the end in mind. The summary that the Buddha says is, so this spiritual life because does not have gain, honor and praise for its benefit or the attainment of virtue for its benefit or the attainment of concentration for its benefit or knowledge and vision for its benefit 
but it is this unshakable deliverance of mind that is the true goal of this spiritual life, its hardwood and its end. This is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So what the Buddha is teaching us today is that there are all these benefits. So on the right-hand side, you can see these are the benefits. And in the diagram in the middle, you can see the tree. So you can see the tree that has the, the twigs and leaves. It has the outer bark, the inner bark, the sapwood and the hardwood. And they all align with these benefits. So the first benefit is the benefit of gain, honor and praise. The second is the benefit of the attainment of virtue. The third is the benefit of attainment of concentration. The fourth is the benefit of knowledge and vision. And then the fifth is this unshakable deliverance of mind, the true goal of our spiritual practice. So the four things are not the true goal. They fall short. And so it's important to remember that, but also to remember they are benefits of this part. They're part of our development process. And so what's really good is when we deep dive into these today, one by one, we get to double check. We get to learn a meditation to see, do we fall for this? Are we vulnerable to this in our practice? And most of us, we think we don't fall for it, that we don't become intoxicated with these things. But what we'll see is that we can and we, and we do. And so in this session, this is our collective opportunity to really look at this. And of course, we have done a separate session on gain, honor, and praise before. And you can see if you don't overcome this, it's very hard to develop further. Using the example of Devadatta, you can see how, how much he fell. Like a lot of what he cultivated was the, the glorification of himself through gain, honor, and praise. And so he couldn't lift himself to develop. He actually declined. So before we go into the actual, each one of those benefits, it's good to map it back to the higher training. So we've seen this before. When we train in higher virtue, adisila sika, then we know these are the things that we train in to be virtuous, to dwell, restrain, consumer in behavior and sphere of activity, seeing the danger in the slightest faults, having undertaken whatever training rules or precepts. And then we have training in higher mind. Our last session, we looked at this in terms of wanting to be secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, entering the mental absorptions, the jhanas. And then the training in higher wisdom which pivots off that is you possess the wisdom of arising and passing away, that which is noble, penetrative, and leads to complete destruction of suffering. One understands as it really is the four noble truths. One understands as it really is the taints, their origin, cessation, and the way leading to their cessation. When we do our sutta meditations, we're encapsulating all of these higher trainings to penetrate, starting with right view, to actually allow that to unfold. That's why we, we undertake virtue. That's why we use the sutta meditations, the instructions of the Buddha to concentrate the mind. What we want to experience is this truth to come to our own wisdom that the Buddha is pointing to. And from there, lean towards Nibbana. So we undertake, what the Buddha says in the Vajiputta Sutta is that we undertake the higher trainings in order to abandon lust, hatred, and delusion, or greed, hatred, and delusion. So when you abandon those things, the Buddha says you won't do anything unwholesome or resort to anything bad. And we can see how just below these boxes, this is what is included is the Noble Eightfold Path. So that's what's included in the aggregates of virtue, concentration, and wisdom. So right speech, right action, right livelihood. It is part of the aggregate of virtue. Right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, part of the aggregate of concentration. And right view and right intention, part of the aggregate of wisdom. And so the things that we're going to talk about in the Mahasaropama Sutta are these benefits here. So what we saw in the tree, again, we see them aligned. The benefit of gain, honor, and praise, the benefit of virtue, which sits under the aggregate of virtue, the benefit of attainment of concentration, it's part of the training in the higher mind, it's one of the benefits, benefit of knowledge and vision, it comes with the higher wisdom training. And therefore, 
when you progressively develop on this lower line, then, or, you know, all of it really, you go from left to right, then you come to eventually the unshakable deliverance of mind. So this is the progressive uh, process that we do to develop in the spiritual life. Another support for this is the Dusila Sutta. This is very good sutta for seeing the links or the connections. So when we talk about this progressive development process, you know, in the higher training, in the Noble Eightfold Path, in these benefits of our practice, this is the teaching that shows that they're connected, that they're linked to each other, that we need each of them in order to progressively develop to fullness. So the question we ask is, what enables us to develop to fullness? Now, in the Dusila Sutta, this is Anguttanikaya Chapter 5, Discourse Number 24, there's two insight pathways. The first one is what prevents us from growing and developing to fullness. And the second is what do we need to possess in order to grow and develop into fullness? So on the right-hand side of the tree, you can see this part of the tree looks very sparse. And the Buddha says that an immoral person for one deficient in virtuous behavior, right concentration lacks its cause. When there is no right concentration for one deficient in right concentration, the knowledge and vision of things is as they really are lacks its proximate cause. When there is no knowledge and vision of things as they really are, for one deficient in the knowledge and vision of things as they really are, disenchantment, dispassion lack their proximate cause. When there is no disenchantment, dispassion, for one deficient in disenchantment and dispassion, the knowledge and vision of liberation lacks its proximate cause. So you see here, it's very hard to grow to fullness. You lack all the ingredients. So it's like saying you lack the higher virtue. So that means you can't get to the, the right concentration. When you lack the right concentration, you can't get to the knowledge and vision of things as they really are. If you have that, then you lack disenchantment and dispassion, which means you don't get to the finality of, of the knowledge and vision that leads to Nibbana. So you can see how they're linked. You need each of them in order to develop. And the opposite side is where you do have them. So if you are virtuous and you have the higher virtue, then it's able for you to develop the right concentration. If you have that right concentration, you're able to have the knowledge and vision of things as they really are. Same, if you have that, then you can possess the disenchantment and dispassion for the world. And then if you have that, then of course, one can attain Nibbana. So in that way, you see, this is, this is what is needed. Now, Mahasaropa Masutta shows us where we veer off track, that we might get enticed with virtue and think that that's enough. We, we think, oh, this, this spiritual life is about virtue. So we stop here. We don't develop to fullness. So if we stop at any of these points, it means we either are compelled or convinced that this is it, this is the, the purpose of practice, or we achieve sufficient sukha that mars our intention, thinking, oh, maybe my intention is fulfilled. There's enough happiness that comes with concentration or virtue or seeing things as they really are, the insights that come with that. And so we, we sort of take our foot off the pedal and not go further. The worst of it is if we start to decline, if we make a, a strong sense of self out of it, we start to cultivate unwholesome things. So this is a, also a very useful uh, sutta because the Buddha says on the one hand that suppose there's a tree deficient in branches and foliage, then its shoots do not grow to fullness. Also its bark, softwood and heartwood do not grow to fullness. So too for an immoral person, one deficient in virtuous behavior, right concentration lacks its proximate cause. And he explains the rest of it in the same way. Whereas if you have a tree that has all the branches and foliage and the shoots grow to fullness, then also the bark grows to fullness, the softwood, and then the heartwood grows to fullness. And that, that's where we really want to be. So this is another helpful sutta. So the Buddha teaches, he begins the Mahasaropama Sutta 
with that opening about Devadatta. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Rajagaha on the mountain Vulture Peak. It was soon after Devadatta had left, there referring to Devadatta, the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus, bhikkhus, here some clansman goes forth out of conviction from the home life into homelessness, considering I am a victim of birth, aging and death, of sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness and despair. I am a victim of suffering, a prey to suffering. Surely an ending of this whole mass of suffering can be known. What's important in this opening statement is our noble aspiration out of conviction towards the Buddha and towards the teachings of the Buddha. We want to find a way out of the whole mass of suffering. So as we said at the beginning, you see the bigger predicament, you understand this is a worthwhile thing to, to start looking for the way out. So even a glimpse of understanding that, that we are at the mercy of this cycle of dukkha, unless we find a way out, this can be the impetus for us to let go of the worldly path to a certain extent and go towards the Buddha's noble path. So it can be practiced by a lay person or for one who, who takes the opportunity to ordain as a monastic. But in either case, if you've connected with the truth of this bigger predicament and you choose the, the super mundane path to develop the noble eightfold path, then this is our way out. And so in our Dhamma session today, we'll mainly look at the lay perspective of how we can learn and apply this teaching. So the first benefit is gain, honor, and praise. And the Buddha says, when he has gone forth thus, he acquires gain, honor, and praise. He is pleased with that gain, honor, and praise, and his intention is fulfilled. On account of it, he lords himself and disparages others. Thus, I am one who gets gain and praise, gain, honor, and praise. But these other bhikkhus are unknown of no account. He becomes intoxicated with that gain, honor and praise, grows negligent, falls into negligence, and being negligent, he lives in suffering. So on the right, you can see how that translates into an insight pathway, a jnanapatta. And the arrow is going down because there is a decline. You dwell in suffering at the end of it. Now, if we look at this, you can see that it's something that can be meditated on that we can unlock how we knowingly or unknowingly get caught or fall for gain, honor, and praise. So let's go through this insight pathway a little bit. So when we are pleased up here, when we are pleased with attainment of gain, honor, and praise, there might be a period in which we think my intention is fulfilled. And it may be because there is happiness that we experience when someone gives us something, whether it's material or whether it's some words or something else, some um, honor that they give. And when that happens, knowingly or unknowingly, so it might begin off, begin unknowingly, but eventually, once you get more intoxicated, because more no, no, knowable, uh, you think it's good like this. It's like, oh, leading the spiritual life is good like this. We get all, all these different things. And once we start thinking that, then we start to think, oh, I can sustain it like this. There's not so much dukkha now, apparently. And, and so you think, oh, I can sustain this and by I can be sustained on this as well. And so it's already turning unwholesome. So when this happens, we start to then get to the next stage, which is we raise ourselves and lower others. So it sounds like, oh, we're up here and you're down there. So you're cultivating more unwholesome states. Then the third one is you become intoxicated with it. So that starts to set in the wrong belief about, about yourself, about you know, what can be gained from the spiritual life, mostly in a material sense, the level of sensual pleasures. And that's even when you receive praise or respect from people. And so when it becomes like that, what we get is like the dart, the poison of unwholesome starts to spread. And then after that, we grow negligent, we fall into that negligence, pamada, and we start to dwell in that as well. And so with that negligence, we come down here, that the desire and attachment for gain, honor, and praise, it starts to set in. 
And so we become quite fixated on it, fixated on sustaining it, getting more, or just being able to exist on it and with that expectation. And so the unwholesome states are swirling around and they're also growing. And so when we try and protect whatever gain, honor, and praise we have received and try and sustain that or maybe get more, that's where we end up dwelling in dukkha, dwelling in suffering. So you can see when you look at it that way, we start with something very wholesome. You know, we come to the spiritual life because we saw something. We learned the Dhamma because we saw something. We practiced the Dhamma because we really saw something. There was an insight and we wanted to develop the Noble Eightfold Path. But then that starts to change as we delight in the gain, honor, and praise. And when all those things set in, we become more conceited, more arrogant. We raise ourselves, low, lower others. But what's really clear is that a strong sense of self starts to set, set in. Something that says, I'm worth something. And, and maybe even to think, I can make these good times last. And so the pleasure derived from gain honor and praise as we know it's only fleeting but at that moment or that period of time you think that it is more lasting than it really is and it's personal it's a personal attainment so when we look at monastics for example just briefly you can see this coming in the form of gaining requisites so material things that are luxurious abundant expensive international travel uh, big arms giving events public speaking invitations, large followings, followers, likes, popularity, bestseller lists, you know, all this overflowing respect and honor, high praise, honorary titles, uh, access to important or influential people, gaining power and prestige. For lay disciples, it can be a little bit of the same. It can also come in the form of gifts, invitations, high praise, popularity, fame, you know, respect, special treatment, offered the best seat, uh, being served first, special treatment. Again, uh, when you bow, uh, when people bow to you, they acknowledge you, they listen to you, uh, they want to see you, all, all those different things. The problem doesn't lie with the people that are giving it. The giver is actually gaining merit and cultivating generosity. So the problem doesn't lie with them. The problem lies with the recipient of that benefit of, of gain, honor, and praise. Because if that person who is the recipient gets intoxicated, develops expectations, breeds desire for it, and becomes negligent as a result for it, it is for their downfall. And so when monastics and lay people come to spiritual life, if they haven't received gain, honor, and praise from the world, and then they're given it in the spiritual context, it can be very intoxicating, very, very intoxicating. But then there's also others who they may have had it in the worldly sense due to their position or their job or something like that. And then they retire and they seemingly lose that, lose that shine. Sometimes someone might be able to consciously or unconsciously gain it in the spiritual sense again. So they use knowledge of Dhamma and, and practice as a means to get it. So it's really important to take some time to, to look at this because it can be a cause of great suffering, great downfall. And the Buddha would always say that it leads to decline from wholesome states, not, not progress, not growing of wholesome states. It only leads to decline because what you're cultivating is then the unwholesome. So when it comes to all the different things like that, what you notice is that inevitably the way it seeps out, whether it's monastic or lay person who becomes intoxicated, it seeps out in, in conduct by body, speech, and mind. You know, someone becomes more willing to belittle others, to compel people to think that they're the best um, at Dhamma. And you can see they start to really decline when they think their Dhamma is better than even the Buddhas, that their words are even more fragrant than the Buddhas. So they inevitably lose sight of the ultimate goal. And it can be really, really shocking and quite disheartening to, to see that, to see that. And for Dhamma teachers, the, 
the meditation of looking at the benefit of gain, honor, and praise is a really good one because if you share Dhamma, if you teach Dhamma, it should really be a compulsory part of the practice to really examine oneself because if you do so, then it ensures the purity of one's practice, you know, that you can sustain the purity of your practice, that there's something worthwhile to share of the Buddhist teachings. Otherwise, you're falling and what you share is actually starting to be quite diluted. And also in terms of authenticity, uh, you're not starting to raise yourself above the Buddha, which is always uh, a bit of a, a danger. In fact, it's a big danger. But for everyone, it's really important to ask oneself, do I get pleased you know, with gain, honor, and praise, that little bit of respect or the, a gift or an offering or, or certain things like that? You know, what are some examples uh, of that in your own life? And you know, do you think in your own mind, uh, I'm someone who receives gifts or invitations or, or regularly receives high praise? And, and those other people don't, um, or they aren't as special as I am. Uh, people listen to me, they don't, don't listen to those other people. I mean, it, it's, it's funny when you say it out loud because it seems so ridiculous. But the thing is, when you look into your own mind, sometimes those things are really there, particularly when you get annoyed about something. And then you ask, do I raise myself above others? On the basis of this gain, honor, and praise, do I get intoxicated with it? Do I think about it when I can next receive some praise or next receive an offering? Are they thinking of giving me something? Or do you notice maybe you get annoyed or irritated or angry if you don't receive it? If you don't re receive someone bowing to you when they did before, or if they don't praise you where they have done before, things like that. And then the other side of it where it gets worse is, when you start to brag or boast about it and it's, it gets quite smelly in terms of, of that kind of conceit and arrogance that is, is coming out. And then to really, once you, if you do see these things, to really then look, am I growing negligent in the practice? Am I practicing for the wrong reasons now? And is my practice actually declining and falling apart? And, and as a result of that, can I see that I'm dwelling in dukkha? because of it so it's really beneficial to examine this quite often what we do is we look around and we pick holes in other people's practice you know because that's what we're prone to do we say oh that person's really conceited about it and that person's really getting bloated with with offerings that they receive or uh, the award that they received or something like that and what's really good is to take that propensity to do that and turn it around so look at yourself and examine whatever you're you're saying that person has to look at yourself and say do I do that you know if I notice that do I have that in me so spiritual practice is very much about inward looking not outward looking so we are prone to look outside at other people but it's good to use that as a pointer to point it back and say, you know, do I have a problem with that? Now, what's really important to remember is we can't know another person's practice anyway, that even the noble arahants, they couldn't tell that another person or, or truly confirm that another person was an arahant. My Venerable Sariputta was teaching someone and he didn't know that the person that he was teaching was an arahant. The Buddha had to come along and, and declare it, declare that. So it's safer to let other people be the owners of their own practice and for us to focus intently on our own. And what's helpful in all the different cases that we're going to go through today is it's good to have a healthy sense of shame and a healthy sense of fear of wrongdoing. This is very good because these are the two things that are connected to neg negligence, that if you don't have the sense of shame and you don't have a fear of wrongdoing, then one tends to be more negligent. Whereas if you do have the sense of shame and the fear of wrongdoing, then you're more likely to be vigilant, to be more humble, not allow oneself to get conceited or arrogant. So when you look at when we seek to gain something personally from the Dhamma, from the spiritual life, one should think that's shameful. That's not something that we're, we're trying to do. If it comes to us, it comes to us and we're grateful, but we don't seek that out. We don't want to make more of it. 
And it's definitely not the true goal of spiritual life. In the Dharana Sutta, which we looked at in our session on the danger of gain, honor, and praise, if you remember, the Buddha says, gain, honor, and praise is bitter. It's vile. It's obstructive to attaining or achieving the unsurpassed security from bondage. So when we fail to see that, um, it's very, very difficult. And if you think about it more deeply, everything that comes as a benefit from the spiritual life is really due to the Buddha. The Buddha is the one who undertook the great renunciation, perfecting it over many, many lifetimes, all the different parami. And the Buddha is the one who perfectly enlightened all on his own with all the noble accomplishments in conduct and knowledge. And that he's the teacher of devas and humans with all the good qualities. So whatever we take as a benefit, such as gain, honor, and praise, you know, we take that as a personal benefit. We're taking something that is due to the blessing of the Buddha. And so in that respect, if that helps to for, for the sense of shame to arise, that, that can be very skillful, very, very useful. Because we are really riding on the, the coattails of the Buddha, his legacy, his teachings, his blessings. So it's very good not to take any of that personally and, and glorify oneself um, in that respect or, or even to glor glorify ourselves higher than the noble arahants. So the Buddha goes on to say, in using this simile of the heartwood, he says, suppose a man needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, came to a great tree standing possessed of heartwood, passing over its heartwood, its sapwood, its inner bark and its outer bark, he would cut off its twigs and leaves and take, away, take them away thinking they were heartwood. Then a man with good sight seeing him might say, this good man did not know the heartwood the sapwood, the inner bark, the outer bark, or the twigs and the leaves. Thus, while needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, he came to a great tree standing possessed of heartwood, passing over its heartwood, its sapwood, its inner bark and its outer bark. He cut off its twigs and leaves and took them away, thinking they were heartwood. Whatever it was this good man had to make with heartwood, his purpose would not be served. So too because... When a clansman goes forth out of conviction, and he repeats the same thing that we said at the beginning, that you end up living in suffering. This bhikkhu is called one who has taken the twigs and the leaves of the spiritual life and stopped short with that. So essentially here, the Buddha is saying, whatever we try to make out of twigs and leaves, it's not going to work. It's, it's not going to work. And also on top of that, we fall short. And the same thing applies to spiritual life, that if we get caught up in something such as gain, honor, and praise, we for sure, we haven't even got to the first rung of the attainment of virtue. We're actually going backwards. We're backsliding into, into unwholesome states. So this is very, very useful because you know that when you take twigs and leaves, you really can't do much with it. And it's very much so far away from the heartwood. So because the Buddha was, would, had Devadatta in mind, it's good to look at Devadatta a little bit further here again, just to remind ourselves. Because if you remember from our Dhamma session, he actually received a lot of lavish offerings from Prince Ajatasattu. And he, Prince Ajatasattu would attend on Devadatta in the morning and evening with 500 carts which had offerings of food and, and other requisites. And so this was conveyed to him in these very lavish pots. And the bhikkhus would witness you know, this procession in the mornings and in the evenings, and then they would go to the Buddha. And so the Buddha counseled the monks by saying, bhikkhus do not be envious of Devadatta's gain, honor, and praise. As long as Prince Ajatasattu goes to attend upon Devadatta morning and evening with 500 carts and an offering of food is conveyed to him in 500 pots, only decline can be expected of Devadatta in regard to wholesome states, not growth. Just as a wild dog becomes even wilder when they sprinkle bile over its nose, so too because as long as Prince Ajatasattu goes to attend upon Devadatta 
Only decline can be expected of Devadatta in regard to wholesome states, not growth. So dreadful bhikkhus are gain, honor, and praise. And then he repeats a little further and says, thus should you train yourselves. So as we know from the story of Devadatta, he came to great downfall. So it's very important to see that gain, honor, and praise lies in particular on the worldly path. It's still very worldly despite us coming to the spiritual path. It's still on the worldly side, imbued with sensual pleasures. And so the world measures that what's valuable, what's worthwhile, still on that same yardstick. You know, when, when you look at uh, how the world values things, it says success, reputation, respect. And so if you come to the spiritual life seeking to replace whatever worldly success you have, but on spiritual terms, then this can be even more intoxicating and uh, because people are offering it steeped in sadha, conviction, faith towards Buddha Dhamma Sangha. And so it's good to be very careful about, about you know, making more out of that. A uh, great decline, downfall can come to monastics, spiritual teachers, whether monastic or lay, lay practitioners. As a result, you can fall on your own sword of, of gain, honor, and praise that, that arises from spiritual practice. So in contrast to that, the example of Gatikara is very useful. Uh, if you haven't heard it before, Gatikara, he... Would, uh, had a very special relationship with Kasava Buddha and would allow, invite and allow the Buddha to come and take alms food from his home even when he wasn't there. And the trust that he had with the Buddha enabled Kasava Buddha to come and do so without any blemishes, any, any issue whatsoever. And when the Buddha's roof was leaking, he simply went and took the, the tiling or the covering from Gatikara's roof to fix the leak uh, in, in the Buddha's residence. And again, no blemish, no, no anything. Gatikara felt so, uh, so warm and, and heartfelt and so blessed to, to have been given all those different opportunities. So when the Buddha was speaking with King Kiki of Kasi, and King Kiki of Kasi, I think, was asking him to spend the vasa, the Buddha refused, saying that he had a very good support and he was going to go back and spend the vasa. Um, back where Gatikara lived, he was explaining the, the good qualities of Gatikara. And as he gave an account about uh, the leaky roof and what was offered by Gatikara, uh, the king dispatched food offerings, like cartloads of red rice stored in the sheaf and source materials to go with it, 500 cartloads to Gatikara, the potter. But when it arrived at Gatikara's home, Gatikara said to King's men, the king is very busy and has much to do. I have enough. Let this be for the king himself. And then he sent it all back. So this is very different from Devadatta. And it's very good to see the comparison, the contrast in, in a way of learning. So what we can see from Gatikara's conduct is that he wasn't interested in receiving the king's support. And he erred on the side of simplicity he was someone who was very easy to support. And as a result of that, he wouldn't be expected to, to decline. So we know that he passed away having attained the fruit of non-return, anagami, and he ascended to the aviha, pure abode. Now, so here's one example that we can take as a role model when it comes to gain, honor, and praise. The other one is Hathika of Alavi. He was endowed with seven amazing and astounding qualities. And the Buddha added an eighth, which was that Hathika is modest and does not want others to know of the skillful qualities present in him. And so this is also highlighting humility rather than arrogance. So he's more modest than pretentious and boastful. There's no external exaltation of himself, nor any internal exaltation of himself. Uh, the other lay disciples who are quite similar was Uga of Vesali and Uga of Hathigama. So these are all worthy lay role models, just a selection there. There are probably more. And when you look at these qualities, it's good to remember this is the type of example that we want to follow uh, and not to get 
intoxicated and, and to be very clear about the spiritual practice, the spiritual life. So what I'd like to do is a short meditation to really take that Dhamma in and to also connect with it. And what we, what we do is we follow the Jnanapatha, the insight pathway. So it's really easy to say, I don't have this or I don't fall for it or whatever, but it's good to really check and it's good to find something to acknowledge, even the smallest thing that you can find in your own practice to work with. So it's better to work from the assumption that it is there, it's faster because in that way you can overcome any obstacles. And when you investigate and acknowledge the presence of it, it's most helpful. It helps you to then work through it. So the beauty of spiritual practice, it comes when you're sincerely honest. Uh, and sometimes in some cases, you know, being brutally honest, and then it's a way of overcoming unwholesome states, you know, and you apply the Buddhist teaching at that point. So more blessings come when we do that. So what we can do is take an example of gain, honor, and praise. So for example, it could be the respect or honor we receive from the community simply by being in Dhamma, like devoted to, to Dhamma. It could come, come in the form of maybe people bowing to us or listening to us when we talk about Dhamma. It could, be, it could be people being very exuberant in offering us gifts or the first opportunity to take food or drink, you know, what arises in our minds. It could be people inviting us to very special Dhamma events and, and things like that. So take whatever example it is that you have for yourself. Then you ask yourself in the first instance up here, do I get pleased with that? You know, because the first part of the Jnana Pathya is you become pleased with it and then you think your spiritual intention is fulfilled. So you think, you ask yourself, am I pleased with that? Do I feel that this is sufficient sukha that my intention is fulfilled around, you know, wanting to find the end of all, all suffering? And sometimes we do get a little intoxicated with that little bit of sukha. So that's where you start. Then you take it a little further and, and then you ask yourself, do I think, oh, I get treated in this way with respect or preferential treatment, but those other people, they don't have the, they don't have that. They're not uh, blessed with that. And so that's, that's another way of looking at it. Or the other way is to say, am I prone to making comparisons with other, others on the basis of gain, honor, and praise? You know, am, am I prone to contempt for other people because they don't get those things? Or do I brag and boast to myself or to others about it? And then if that's the case, then you ask yourself, you take it further and you ask yourself, am I becoming intoxicated with that? Do I expect it? Do I desire to be esteemed on the basis of gain, honor, and praise, seen in a favorable light? Am I cultivating unwholesome states as a result of this? You know, is there envy? Is there competition? Is there conceit? Is there arrogance, derogation, disparaging? You know, another way of looking at it is, is there a stronger sense of Dhamma self, you know, the spiritual practitioner? And do I worry that it won't come? That's the other part of it. And then you ask yourself, am I starting to veer off the path, you know, growing negligent? Am I focusing too much on that rather than the development of the path, the development of virtue, concentration, wisdom? So you ask yourself, honestly, is, is my spiritual practice declining as a result of this? And then finally, you get to the last one. If there is negligence, am I dwelling in dukkha? You know, is the craving or desire for gain, honor, and praise something that is causing dukkha? And, and when you do see this, if you come to the end of it, you really go through with, with sincere honesty towards it, then you then reflect on the Buddha that all these blessings that we're receiving as part of the spiritual life, we owe it to him. It's not something that is personal. And then you reflect on the noble arahants, the lay disciples of the Buddha who practice well, and you think they don't behave like this. And then you make a very strong intention not to be taken up with gain, honor, and praise. So that's, that's how you do the meditation. So let's do this meditation for, let's say, about 10 minutes. I think it's good to really make a good go of this. And see what arises in the meditation and, and just find a really good example. So let's start now. Teruan Saranai. I'll bring us back when it's when it's time again. Teruan Saranai.
Erwan Saranai, we can come out of the meditation now. Hopefully you got a glimpse uh, by doing that Jnanapatha, that inside pathway of what the Buddha means when we take gain, honor and praise in the wrong way. So we'll move on to the next benefit. So the second benefit or is the attainment of virtue. And again, the Buddha says, he has the same opening, which is here because some clansmen goes forth out of conviction from home life into homelessness, considering that they're a victim of birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair. And they're a victim of suffering, a prey to suffering. Surely an ending of this whole mass of suffering can be known. So we begin with a wholesome, a wholesome state wanting to renunciate, wanting to walk this path. But then he goes on to say, when he has gone forth thus, he acquires gain, honor, and praise. He is not pleased with that gain, honor, and praise, and his intention is not fulfilled. So this, this particular person has wised up. So he does not, on account of it, lord himself, disparage others. He does not become intoxicated with that gain, honor, and praise. He does not grow negligent and fall into negligence. So very good so far. Being vigilant, he achieves the attainment of virtue. He is pleased with that attainment of virtue and his intention is fulfilled. Ah. So on account of it, he lords himself and disparages others. I am virtuous, of good character, but these other bhikkhus are immoral, of evil character. He, fall, he becomes intoxicated with that attainment of virtue, grows negligent, falls into negligence, and being negligent, he dwells in suffering. So again, we have the insight pathway that comes up, this time not for gain, honor, and praise, because we didn't fall for that. But now what we're falling for, or we're getting caught up in, is the attainment of virtue. So this can happen knowingly or unknowingly, consciously or unconsciously, and we end up in dukkha. So when we go through this, similar to how we went through with gain, honor, and praise, we become pleased with the attainment of virtue. Whatever that virtue is, it could be keeping the five precepts as a lay person, or maybe keeping eight precepts, or in some cases for periods of time, keeping 10 precepts. It could be the fact that when you make an attempt towards the higher training of virtue, seeing danger in the slightest faults, you feel that that attainment has fulfilled your intention. So the happiness that comes with having purified bodily conduct, verbal conduct, and mental conduct, we may think, it's good like this, you know, or we think, oh, we can sustain the spiritual life just on this. We don't need to do more. And so it's already starting to turn a little unwholesome. And it gets worse when we start to raise ourselves. So we, we are familiar with this when we think, oh, I keep eight pre precepts on occasion and go stay in the monastery and those people don't, or I'm much better at keeping my speech intact. Those people aren't you know, on and on, it can go like that. And so it's basically the same sound. I'm up here and you're down there. So more unwholesome. And then when we get intoxicated with the attainment of virtue, then again, the wrong belief about ourselves starts to set in, we start to create this sense of self that is so pure, or we think that it is so pure, but it is already already falling. The poison of unwholesome states, defilements is setting in, it's spreading. And so on account of that, the Buddha says that we grow negligent, we fall into negligence. And so that negligence, it really starts to impact like our desire and attachment to our own virtue. It becomes a fixation and we're growing the unwholesome states, the defilements, particularly as we try to protect it or sustain it. And particularly when we try and hold it out to others as something that is wonderful. And so from that point of view, we end up again down here, you know, dwelling in suffering. So again, what was wholesome, what started as wholesome, you didn't fall or we didn't fall for the gain, honor and praise. Now we're falling for the fact that there is uprightness, that there's virtue, that we observe particular precepts, that we're being diligent towards the practice, maybe even observing the uposatha, you know, once a month, twice a month, four times a month, whatever that is. So it starts to change into something that where we take delight purely in the attainment of virtue. And then that's where the unwholesome states kick in, the bad desires start to kick in, and then arrogance, conceit. So again, it reinforces a very strong sense of atta, really, really strong sense of self, 
you value oneself just on the basis of, of attainment of virtue. And you also start to, again, make that nicha, make that, oh, this is permanent, this, this lasts, and you lose sight of, of the goal. So for monastics, you know, sometimes the example that, that comes is forest monks looking down at city monks, uh, you know, people, the monastics that keep very strong Vinaya, even the minor rules, they look down on the ones breaking, breaking those minor rules, uh, you know, monastic derogating and disparaging each other, or even disparaging lay people who, who are developing the supramundane path. And from lay disciples, there's all permutations of a very similar thing. It's looking down at others for the number of precepts that they keep or don't keep, uh, thinking that one's own virtue as a lay person is higher than a monastic. There are people, there are examples of this. And these are monastics who are keeping the Vinaya, the 227 rules or the 311 rules in the case of nuns. It's, it comes out in different ways that people speak and, and, and think. And then it's also looking down at others because, you know, one might observe the Aposita, other people don't, or uh, people go and stay in the monastery and observe eight precepts, others don't, or you know, you, you live like a monastic at home. And, and so you build this kind of conceit and arrogance and, and lots of different defilements. So there's all different ways that we can disparage one another on the basis of virtue. So it, it is a, a huge downfall. Now, what the Buddha goes on to say is that this is really the outer bark. So he says, suppose a man needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, came to that great tree standing possessed of heartwood, he passes over the heartwood, the sapwood, the inner bark, and he cuts off the outer bark, taking it away, thinking it was heartwood. So a man who is wise or a person who is wise, who sees that, sees what that person does and realizes that they've taken the outer bark and realize that the person's purpose would not be served because they haven't got the heartwood, even though they were seeking it. So in the spiritual life, it's the same thing. When we take the outer bark, which is this attainment of virtue, and we stop short with that, then we have lost, uh, lost our way in, in many ways. We're not striving and continuing towards ultimate liberation. Instead, we, we fall short. We think the attainment of virtue is enough or it's, it's great or we just get imbued with that. So when we look at the higher training, and map it back to that, we get caught just at this instance here, training in higher virtue. So we receive the benefit of the attainment of higher virtue, but we don't progress to concentration of the mind, to wisdom, and then beyond that, which is this gradual training process that we are on the path for. And when you look at that, one of the modes of progress for a seika a trainee, as we know, is the accomplishment in virtue. So the fully perfected Buddha, the noble Arahants, they have perfected that. They are Aseka when it comes to the accomplishment in virtue. And they are really our role models. So if we at any point in our practice think that we have accomplished that, then of course, it's not true. It's a lie. And it's really important to humble ourselves, to bring us back down in order so that we don't become negligent and don't get conceited or, or run off in the wrong direction, veer off the spiritual path on the basis of, of virtue. So there's still more to develop is really what the point is, that if you, fall, if you stop at the point of the attainment of virtue, no matter how pristine you think the, the virtue is, but then you recognize that all these unwholesome states are coming in, then you realize, actually, I haven't really got this either. And what's really important is to see that Adisila, this training in higher virtue, it has all these qualities. One is virtuous, one dwells restrained, consummate in behavior and sphere of activity, seeing danger in the slightest faults. So when you start to recognize that unwholesome states are coming in, thinking that you're better than somebody else, you're already starting to slide. So it's really important to nip it in the bud um, and, and really look at it. 
uh, because if, if we don't look at it, then it's very difficult to concentrate the mind because you need to be secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. And really, when you start to glorify any attainment of virtue and pretty much you want praise for it, then you're back in the realm of sensual pleasures and you're back in the realm of in, in unwholesome states. So the, the higher concentration of mind becomes difficult to, to realize. We can now look at what the Buddha says about not for the sake of purification of virtue. This is a really useful sutta. This is the Dutya Gilana Sutta in Sangyutikaya chapter 35, discourse number 75. This is our confirmation that this is only the outer bark, not the heartwood, the attainment of virtue. So this is where a newly ordained monk, he was sick. And the Buddha visited him uh, to, to encourage him and offer some support in the Dhamma. And so he says to the monk, um, you know, some Dhamma to him. And they have this sort of dialogue or questioning about, you know, what the spiritual practice is about. And the Buddha basically asks him uh, the, this, this venerable basically says, I understand, venerable sir, that it is not for the sake of purification of virtue that the Dhamma has been taught by the Blessed One. And so the Buddha says, if Bhikkhu, you understand that the Dhamma has not been taught by me for the sake of purification of virtue, then for what purpose do you understand the Dhamma to have been taught by me? And then he responds by saying, venerable sir, I understand the Dhamma to have been taught by the Blessed One for the sake of final Nibbana without clinging. And of course, the Buddha says, good, good, Bhikkhu. It is good that you understand the Dhamma has been taught by me for the sake of final Nibbana without clinging. And yeah, so when you look at that, uh, you remember the Buddha also did many years of austere practices, Dutanga, and he also realized that that's not the way that you liberate and realize Nibbana, the final goal. And that particular form of practice uh, is, can be unhelpful. So instead, he found this middle way. And I think that's also something that is helpful to remember. In the Ratha Vinita Sutta, this is also a middle-length discourse, number 24, uh, Venerable Sariputta is having a Dhamma discussion with Venerable Puna Vanta Niputta. And they're talking about the stages of purification as part of developing the spiritual path. And Venerable uh, Puna Bhanta Niputta gives the simile of the relay chariots in order to help people to understand. But essentially, again, there's a confirmation that this teaching of the Dhamma is not for the sake of purification of, of virtue, the attainment of virtue. It's actually for the complete extinguishment without grasping. So... The reason why we train in higher virtue is really because it aligns our conduct. So when it aligns, we are able to activate the Noble Eightfold Path. path. It's only one portion of what we're trying to do. And it's good to know where it sits within that and not to just think this is it. This is the final, final part to our practice. So another sutta that's very helpful is when we look at virtue and observances and uh, the Buddha is having a discussion with Venerable Ananda about becoming pleased with the attainment of virtue. And, uh, you know, what he's really pointing to is the danger point, you know, being able to see, you know, the danger point. And so in this particular sutta, uh, he asked Venerable Ananda, are all virtue and observances, austere lifestyles and spiritual life fruitful when set up as the essence? And Venerable Ananda responds, this is no simple matter, sir. And then the Buddha encourages and he says, well, then Ananda, break it down. And Venerable Ananda breaks it down and says, take the case of someone who cultivates virtue and observances, an austere lifestyle and a spiritual life, setting them up as if they were the essence if unwholesome qualities then increase and wholesome qualities decline, such virtue and observances or seer lifestyle and spiritual life set up as the essence are fruitless. But if the unwholesome qualities decline while the wholesome qualities increase, then such virtue and observances or seer lifestyle and spiritual life set up as the essence are fruitful. And that's what 
Venerable Ananda said, and the teacher approved. So when we practice, it's really good to look at whether unwholesome qualities increase. I mean, this is always the basis of our practice. We always look at, are there unwholesome states? And if there are, we need to abandon them, knock them out. And so when we look at the attainment of virtue, we need to be very sure why we are delighting in them, whether we are clinging to them, getting intoxicated, and then the unwholesome states increase. Because if that becomes the essence of the practice, then it is fruitless, as the Buddha and Venerable Ananda would say. So this again aligns with Mahasara Ropama Sutta, that it's important to really examine it, look at the attachment, look at where we are falling short and clinging to the outer bark. Now, with Devadatta, he was very, very bad in the sense of he tried to cause a schism in the Sangha. And he tried to do this by requesting five things that he said would support the fewness of wishes, contentment, the erasing of defilements, ascetic practices, uh, being inspiring, uh, reduction in things, and also being energetic. So that was how he pitched it to the Buddha. And the five things were essentially extra rules. Uh, to be observed by the Sangha, things that things to be added to the Vinaya. And so you see this in the Sangha Beda chapter. And basically what he was saying was monks should stay in the wilderness uh, for life and not stay in you know, inhabited areas, otherwise it would be an offense. The second was eat only alms food, not accept invitations for meals, otherwise that would be an offense. The third was being rag robe wearers for life, not accepting a robe from a householder, otherwise that would be an offense. The fourth was living at the foot of a tree for life. And if you take shelter, then that's an offense, like covered shelter. And the fifth was not eating fish or meat for life, otherwise you would commit an offense if you did so. So the Buddha rejected these five things that Devadatta requested. And Devadatta had anticipated that. He had evil wishes in making that request because when he departed with his followers, he used that outcome with the Buddha, the rejection of the, the request, as a way to sway the people of Rajagaha, that the Buddha had rejected those higher rules and that you know, David Dutta and his followers were practicing in accordance with the, the five extra rules. And so the foolish people, they went along and thought, oh, uh, the Buddha and those monastics, uh, they're, they're not living uh, to raise those types of defilements. Um, they're more extravagant and live a life of indulgence, whereas uh, David Dutta and his followers are, are actually, you know, practicing asceticism and, and living in this particular way with the higher virtue. But the wise people, they could see what was happening and they had conviction and confidence in the Buddha. And so they complained and criticized Devadatta. You know, how could Devadatta pursue this kind of schism with the Sangha? How could he break, you know, with the, the authority? And so this was how Devadatta was brought before the Buddha and the Sangha. And then he, he was accused and, and then suspended because, you know, foolish people would lose confidence in, in the noble Sangha. So when you try to uh, do something based on virtue, such as what Devadatta did, and making it more ascetic for the wrong reasons and cultivating more unwholesome states, in, in his case, it was out of envy, competition, arrogance, conceit, and really wanting to defame uh, the, the noble Sangha, then, then you know, there is danger there. So that's uh, one, one example and where the Buddha was coming from in terms of the Mahasaropama Sutta. So we can do another meditation uh, looking at this attainment of virtue. You get a, an impression of where the Buddha is coming from uh, in, in looking at this benefit that it really is, you know, when you practice well, you do get this benefit. It's when you get overly pleased with it, intoxicated with it and start to breed unwholesome states that one really needs to pull yourself into check. So again, take an example and follow the Yanapatha, the insight pathway. And the example could be about being very diligent in keeping the five precepts. It could be uh, making a very concerted effort about one of the precepts, such as uh, maybe uh, refraining from idle chatter. Uh, it could be about observing the Upasutta. It could be about 
leading the, the spiritual life as a lay person on eight precepts. It could be whatever example is the most relevant to you. And again, you apply it in the same way. You know, are you pleased with that? Does it fulfill your aspiration because you think you're very pure? And is your practice based solely on the attainment of virtue from that point? You take it a little further and are you glorifying yourself, whether it's externally or whether it's even in your own mind? Because we're trying to actually not get caught in these things. So if you think I am a virtuous person, really good character, I keep these sets of precepts and other lay practitioners or worldly people are immoral and, and evil in character or uh, my virtue is better than those monastics at the, the temple who do bad things and they even eat at night and I don't. You know, there's so many different ways that we talk to ourselves or even say it out to others and, and it can be quite unwholesome. And then a lot of the time it's when we make comparisons to others on the basis of virtue or we have contempt for others on the basis of virtue or we highlight others' faults. You know, sometimes we also virtue sing signaling, you know, attempting to show people how good we are. That's also defiled. And then you take it further and you look at the intoxication with it, clinging to it, wanting to be esteemed over it. Um, having a sense of self-importance over virtue. And that if that continues and escalates, then you, you look at whether you grow negligent, you know, you're not going towards even at the attainment of concentration. You just think, oh, it's enough at the level of virtue and, and you allow these unwholesome states to, to be there. So you ask yourself, have I lost my way? Uh, have I started to decline? Is the goal being subverted by my own, you know, wrong intentions. And then you look at, you know, when you dwell in this negligence, is there craving or desire to be seen in this good light and to, to receive the sukkah of that uh, and not to see the dukkha of unwholesome states? So when you see that again, it's good to humble oneself to the Buddha and the noble arahants who have the perfect accomplishment of virtue and, and to realize, you know, with humility, uh, it's, it's not something that one wishes to cultivate, that we are still learners, we're still trainees. And uh, the attainment of virtue is something that helps other parts of the spiritual development process. It's only one part of higher training. And so it's important to see it very much as the outer bark. And then, of course, to make a strong intention. So let's do this meditation for another 10 minutes. Again, this time, just focus purely on the attainment of virtue and, and pick your own example and just work through this insight pathway. Peruvan Sadhanai. Let's do this meditation. Peruvan Sadhanai.
Erwan Saranai, we can come out of our meditation now. Let's now move on to the next attainment or benefit. And this is looking at the attainment of concentration. So again, the Buddha starts out by talking about someone who's gone forth because they understand that we are a victim of birth, aging, and death, and you see the whole mass of suffering. And so you're searching for the ending of the whole mass of suffering. And so he says, when he has gone forth thus, he acquires gain, honor, and praise. He is not pleased with that gain, honor, and praise, and his intention is not fulfilled. Being vigilant, he achieves the attainment of virtue. He is pleased with that attainment of virtue, but his intention is not fulfilled. He does not, on account of it, lord himself and disparage others. He does not become intoxicated with that attainment of virtue. He does not grow negligent and fall into negligence. Being vigilant, he achieves the attainment of concentration. He is pleased with that attainment of concentration and his intention is fulfilled. On account of it, he lords himself and disparages others. Thus, I am concentrated. My mind is unified, but these other bhikkhus are unconcentrated where their minds are stray. He becomes intoxicated with that attainment of concentration, grows negligent, falls into negligence, and being negligent, he dwells in suffering. So again, we have the same Yanapatha, the same inside pathway, demonstrating how we can get caught in the attainment of concentration. So one hasn't fallen for gain, honor, and praise. So you know that the intention is not fulfilled. You see the blessing of it. But you're also pleased with the attainment of virtue, but you know that the intention is not fulfilled. You're working towards the higher training and concentration, using that virtue as a foundation. But the problem is you get caught in the attainment of concentration. That's where the unwholesome states start to arise. So when you look at that, you start to think, oh, it's good like this, you know, entering the jhanas, uh, being able to sustain unified, one-pointed mind. Uh, being sustained on it, even though the external conditions are challenging, you, you see that the attainment of concentration is good. But it's when you start to raise yourself and disparage others. You know, I'm up here and you're down there, the same kind of thing. So unwholesome is starting to grow. You become intoxicated with that and there's a strong sense of self starting to form again. And the poison is really the unwholesome states of superiority and a separate sense of self and so when that intoxication grows we grow negligent and fall into negligence so there is an attachment and desire that becomes much stronger when it comes to the attainment of concentration the fixation of it as we've said before and you're trying to protect that concentration sustain it but also glorify it and so you become one who dwells in suffering as a result of that so again, we see here something that is wholesome. So developing the higher training of concentration, higher training of mind, you get the concentration. And by this, we mean the right concentration within the Noble Eightfold Path. It's one-pointed. We become very calm. Uh, and it's not the ordinary concentration, but the one that you enter the jhanas, you still the hindrances, the stilling of all thoughts. Uh, you experience you know, the bliss of the jhanas, the, the peace, and then, of course, the equanimity. So you go through the whole range of it. And it can be also other uh, attainments of concentration, such as also the formless attainments, you know, to see what that is also like, to know that it is also unstable, and then further on from that as well, uh, even getting to Niroda Samapati. So being able to see the cessation of all feeling and, and perception, at least temporarily, so when we start to take delight in the attainment of concentration and unwholesome states come in and we get conceited and arrogant, then you see that really strong sense of self. You start to behave in a particular way, say things in a particular way, think in a particular way that glorifies oneself. And so that pleasure, that's also something that, that one sees as lasting. You get a bit duped by it. But when you get to the attainment of concentration, it's really good to see it as a means to an end, that you want to see that it's still unstable, that it's not Nibbana, that you can still shake from that. It's not unshakable. And most of us who do these sutta meditations, you really start to see it, that even with the much higher concentrations, as subtle as you can get, at some point you can still fall. 
And that's the whole point of getting to higher concentration. But that's still not it. And as we'll see, it's the inner bark and you don't fall for that, but you know it. You know that it is the inner bark. So when it comes to monastics and lay people together, when you develop this intoxication with the attainment of concentration, it's when you start looking down at others for their lack of right concentration, not being able to enter the jhanas, uh, not being able to easily concentrate the mind. Maybe their meditative abilities are not as good as, as, as yours or, or things like that. And so you have this sense of specialness that comes. And even if you teach, you, you teach from the sense of, oh, I can do this. And, and sometimes you still teach even though you've lost the ability to enter the jhanas because you entered it one time and then suddenly you created this new sense of self and and you you go on and on about it but you've actually lost that that ability so sometimes it's very interesting with this particular attainment that uh, when you look at even devadatta he had certain ability to concentrate in the early stages of his practice and even had some supernormal powers just normal it is like not not anywhere close to the Buddha or some of the other noble arahants. And yet the minute he thought about uh, wanting to take over from the Buddha, he lost certain abilities, the ability to concentrate, the ability to, to have supernormal powers. And that's probably down to all the unwholesome states that he started to cultivate and then all the bad actions that, that followed from that. So it all fell away. So it's very good to be cautious about the reason why we develop the higher concentration. It's not to create another sense of self and it's not to get in, imbued and intoxicated in it. And again, like with all the, the, the last two that we looked at, it's really to reflect on the Buddha and the noble arahants that they're the ones that encourage us towards the higher attainments. But it's, the purpose of it is very much in order to see the truth, in order to be free of the unwholesome states, free of sensual pleasures, in order from this purified state of mind to contemplate the truth, to develop wisdom. It's only another foundation as part of the development process. And when you see that, then you know that, well, okay, there's more to do. Nibbana is the only one that is the safe refuge. All these ones still shake. Uh, they, you can still fall from even attainments of, of concentration. They're still temporary. Then when you look at what the Buddha says about the inner bark, so we come back to the simile of the heartwood. Again, the Buddha says, suppose a man needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, comes to a great tree standing possessed of heartwood. And so he passes over heartwood, sapwood, but he cuts off the inner bark and takes it. So he doesn't fall for the outer bark or the twigs or the leaves. And so a wise person seeing that still sees that the person will not have their purpose served because they've still only taken the inner bark. It's not the hard word. And so the same thing relates to spiritual life that you've stopped short simply at the attainment of virtue, whereas you need to, to go on to develop uh, knowledge and vision and disenchantment and and revulsion with, with the world and to then look at knowledge and vision of being able to liberate oneself. So here, if we just come back quickly to the mapping to the higher training, we see, you know, we, we've developed the higher virtue that's become the foundation, the proximate cause to be able to have the training in the higher mind to get to the right concentration because we've been secluded from all the unwholesome states and the sensual pleasures. So we have this. So the benefit is the attainment of concentration. But you can see there's more to do. From that concentration, that is where you start to see the truth much more quick and also much deeper because the mind is more purified, more luminous, and it's no longer covered by hindrances and defilements. So it's really important at this point to see it's not the final goal. There's more to do. And when you see this, then you know, okay, it's only the inner bark. So when we look at different developments of concentration, there's a sutta, another sutta called the Samadhi Bhavana Sutta. This is the one from Anguttara Nikaya, chapter four, discourse number 41, where it talks about four different kinds of concentration or developments of concentration. So the one that leads to dwelling happily in the present life. So this aligns with our higher training and concentration because secluded from sensual pleasures and unwholesome states. So this is Dhamma Sukha Vihara. 
The second is the development of concentration that leads to the obtaining of knowledge and vision. So jnana dasana, patilabhaya. This is the one where, that we want to be able to cultivate because this leads to the next benefit, knowledge and vision. And how you develop this is the perception of light, aloka sanya. So when you do this, the mind becomes quite open and uncovered and very luminous. And then the third one is the development of concentration that leads to mindfulness and clear comprehension. So sati sampajanya. And this is where you know when feelings arise and you know when they're present and when they disappear. The same with perceptions. You know when they arise, when they remain present and when they disappear. <clears throat> so there are different sutta meditations where, where this can actually, uh, we can actually see this. And then the fourth one is the development of concentration that leads to the destruction of the taint. So asavanang kayaya. So of course, uh, if you remember the Sabadi Bhavana Sutta, the one in Sangyutta Nikaya, 22, uh, chapter 22, discourse number five, where we look at the arising and passing away of the five aggregates, that's the meditation that helps us to develop the concentration that leads to the destruction of the taints. So you can see there are different ways of developing concentration. You know, this is mostly out of the higher training in the mind or in the concentration of mind. And what we see from all of this really, particularly when we go through uh, number two, three, and four, is we want to develop, con or actually all of them, if you want to develop concentration that leads us to develop the wisdom, knowledge and vision, the wisdom. And so this supports the progress on the path. If we stop here simply at just the attainment of concentration and, and get imbued with it and glorify it and simply create a sense of self out of it, then we don't actually taste the true goal of, of our practice. And really what you can see is craving for just the attainment of concentration is, is going for the cheaper stuff, not the most valuable and we will always fall from that. So it's good to not get too intoxicated, but to also know that sometimes we can become quite bloated, even from little bits of sukha from the attainment of concentration, just the ability to enter the jhanas without trouble or difficulty. Sometimes it, it's hit and miss. Sometimes it could be even just seeing nimittas that one could get intoxicated. There's all different versions of how one can get uh, intoxicated. So it's very good to stay very level-headed, keep practicing, uh, practicing with humility, uh, not arrogance and conceit, and always think of the Buddha and the noble arahants as being our, our, our role models. So we won't do the meditation uh, we'll keep going, I think. But you can see that it is possible to do the same meditation using the insight pathway and pertaining to this attainment of concentration. Again, you would take the same example. It could be around entering the jhanas. It could be being able to navigate them without difficulty. It could be entering the formless attainments as well. It could be niroda samapati, being able to access the cessation of uh, feeling and perception. Uh, or some variation of that and where you think that you know one is actually better than others and then it leads to all that decline and so you basically question yourself as we've done before the whole way through so then the fourth uh, benefit that we come to that we spoke a little about just then is knowledge and vision jnana dasanam so again, the Buddha starts with, you know, clansmen going forth out of conviction. You, you see that, you know, victim of birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair, victim of suffering. And so you want to find the end to the suffering, the whole mass of suffering. And so the Buddha then goes on to say, when he has gone forth thus, he acquires gain, honor and praise. He is not pleased with that gain, honor and praise and his intention is not fulfilled. So being vigilant, he then achieves the attainment of virtue, but he doesn't fall for that. His intention is not fulfilled. And so being vigilant, he achieves the attainment of concentration. He's pleased with that, but his intention is not fulfilled. So all that is very good. There is progress being made. So then he, he's vigilant and one achieves knowledge and vision. So he's pleased with that knowledge and vision, but he thinks at that point, the intention is fulfilled. So 
lauds oneself, disparages others, and says, I live knowing and seeing, but these other bhikkhus live unknowing and unseeing. And so it becomes intoxicated with knowledge and vision, grows negligent, falls into negligence, and being negligent dwells in suffering. So when we look at this particular insight pathway, you know, you end up in dukkha again. You end up dwelling in suffering because you become pleased with maybe insight knowledge, things that arise that you connect with the Dhamma in your meditation. You think, oh, that's so fragrant. Wow. Other people can't see this. Uh, and, and each time you meditate, something else connects and, and you take delight. That's one thing. It's a very wholesome thing. But it's when it starts to be arrogant that you think, I can sustain just on this and be sustained on this, that you think, oh, maybe I've reached the final goal at this point. And so one thing could be misapprehension. But the other thing is when you start to glorify yourself thinking, hmm, I'm, I'm up here and you're down there again. You know, these unwholesome states uh, start to, to appear. And also sometimes you like to hear the sound of your own Dhamma a lot you know, the insight that comes of that. The other part of it with knowledge and vision, which we'll see when we look in, in another sutta, is that the knowledges are also around the divine eye, around being able to recollect past lives, around having certain supernormal powers, uh, things like that. And there, you can see there are certain people, monastic and lay people, who also have been able to develop the, these abilities. And when they do so, and they take it in the wrong way, they start to build a sense of self over it, then it can also be quite harmful to themselves and also to others. And so that's also another example of that, that when it becomes very much a sense of intoxication with those abilities, those knowledges, and also what you see is insight into the Dhamma, you develop a wrong belief about yourself, a sense of self-importance, uh, maybe even greater than the Buddha and the noble Arahants, then the poison of unwholesome states, you know, spreads and grows. And then you become negligent about continuing with the development path. And when that happens, uh, you, you start to dwell in suffering because you protect that, you sustain it. Sometimes you even pre pre uh, uh, pre pretend that you still have insight knowledge when, when it's gone because of unwholesome states, you lose it. And so you work on the memory of it rather than the authenticity of the actual experience, the direct experience. And we can all be subject to a little bit of that or a lot of that, but it's good to humble ourselves and see it for what it is. Because in that way, with humility, one can still grow. One doesn't start to uh, get quite bloated in these memories of, of insight. So again, we see what was wholesome, that is developing insight and wisdom from the meditation, uh, even developing some of these abilities, these knowledges that the Buddha, uh, you know, he himself had, you know, based on this right concentration, then we penetrate certain truth of the Buddha's teachings, you know, there's certain aha moments in our meditation, and we develop the luminous mind and develop higher knowledges such as recollecting past lives seeing other people's seeing other people's past lives uh, having the divine eye and so on but when that starts to change to unwholesome then that's where we have to be very very careful and really nip that in the bud so even to see the pleasure of having certain ability of of knowledge and vision of seeing the way things really are it's it's good but you need to be very careful not to think that that's going to sustain you and so when you look at examples of monastics and lay people it's really getting intoxicated with our own insight looking down at at those that, that don't appear to have penetrated the truth or we think that they're wrong or glorifying our abilities to have access to higher knowledges and, and really just focusing on that. Like sometimes you see people focusing just on being able to re recollect past lives or being able to see other people's past lives. And they do a, a little uh, campaign of, of, you know, talking to people and just purely focusing on that and, and losing sight of saying, well, actually, the spiritual life is not to be led purely for that. It's good to see it so you see the truth. 
but it's not the sum total of our practice. The supreme safety is in Nibbana, not in those, those abilities. So in Devadatta's case, he could see certain things, like he had certain supernormal powers, but they were not in the vicinity of the Buddha's attainments, the higher knowledges. He could do things like disguise himself as a young boy, like appear in front of Prince Ajatasattu as this young boy draped in snakes and compel Prince Ajatasattu through that vision uh, and, and get him on board. But the minute he became intoxicated with it, he lost that ability, that, that limited ability. So when you look at that, you look at the Buddha, the Buddha surpasses everyone in terms of knowledge and vision, 73 knowledges, and six of them which are unique to the Buddha. And, and you find that in the Patisambhita Magga, and probably also in other places of the Sutta Pitika. And then you look at the noble arahants, you know, there are so many examples. You look at Venerable Mahamogalana, Venerable Anuruddha, you know, other examples of, of noble arahants who had higher knowledges. And, and certain abilities as well. And so when we become intoxicated with the little bit that we do attain in our spiritual practice, it's important to be shameful, you know, to, to glorify or, or big ourselves up or anything like that. Because if we rest our spiritual practice on those things, whatever they are, then we still haven't found the heart word. We've only found the sap word. So the Buddha goes on to say, you know, you, you seek heartwood, you need heartwood, you seek heartwood, you're searching for heartwood, you come to the tree, but what you take away is the sapwood. And so a wise person also sees that the person has taken the sapwood. And so your purpose will not be served, whatever you try to make. And the same with us, that what we need to do is to not fall short at these things. So when you look at the map, to higher training, again, where we are is the training in higher wisdom. We are still training with that and we come to some benefit of knowledge and vision. You know, this is the wisdom part of the path. And what the Buddha really says is that we need to enjoy the fact that we are starting to really penetrate the Dhamma. So we're starting to possess the wisdom that starts to see the Samudaya Tangama of condition very good we're also starting to see the four noble truths you know starting to penetrate that as we're trainees we wouldn't have fully developed uh, or realized aspects of the path but we're starting to and that's very very good but also we're starting to hear about okay how do we destroy the taints we don't fully have this information yet as seekers but we're starting to head in that good direction and so there are certain benefits that come with knowledge and vision the main thing is to understand that we're still for sure. And so we cannot rest on whatever insight knowledge we have, whatever higher knowledges in terms of abilities that we have. It's still only the sap word. And so unshakable deliverance of mind is over here, not there yet, still more to do. So in terms of knowledges, a good sutta is the Samanyapala Sutta. And there are other ones as well, but this has the list of eight different knowledges. And it's, it's a good enough list to look at because you can see that there's insight knowledge. knowledge. Uh, you can see there's knowledge of the mind-made body, knowledge of modes of supernormal power, so different idis. There's knowledge of the divine ear, so dibasota. There's also knowledge encompassing the minds of others. Uh, that's also uh, an ability. There's also the knowledge of recollecting past lives, knowledge of the divine eye, and the knowledge of the destruction of the taints. Now, what we find is the last three are the ones that are often spoken about in, rela in relation to sacred training. So recollecting past lives, knowledge of the divine eye, and knowledge of the destruction of the taints. Because in order to become accomplished uh, in terms of knowledge, those are the ones that are often referred to. So if you go to the Sekha Paripada Sutta, those three are, are mentioned and uh, need to, to be developed in, in certain ways. Um, now, when you look at this, you can see that one can become intoxicated with any one of those things. And so when you know that these are the things that are there, it's good if, if one can develop certain abilities, but at the end of the day, they, they don't actually help you to, to be free of all suffering other than the last one, which is 
knowledge of the destruction of the taints. And so when you look at knowledge and vision in terms of jnana dasana, that is the one that you want to develop in order to complete the path and find someone who can help you with that. So again, there's a meditation that one can do, which we won't do right now. It is really, again, taking your own example, looking at what you're pleased at. It could be around a specific Dhamma thing that you've penetrated. It could be about recalling past lives, even recalling them consecutively backwards. It could be about being able to see with the divine eye different realms, being able to travel in mind-made body, being able to connect with the pure abodes, all kinds of things all kinds of knowledges, higher knowledges. So whatever the example is that relates to you where you think that there may be some unwholesome states that enter, you do this meditation the same way that we've done before, looking at whether you're pleased with it, whether you think the spiritual intention is fulfilled, whether you then start to glorify yourself and belittle others, whether from that point it means you get intoxicated because you're breeding more unwholesome states, therefore growing negligent, not uh, practicing further, and therefore dwelling in suffering, trying to protect uh, that knowledge and vision, trying to be sustained by that knowledge and vision. So that's the meditation that one would do. And really at the end of it again is to humble oneself to the Buddha and the Noble Arahants, reflect on their good example, reflect on the fact that we're still learners and trainees, that uh, when you see that, then it's only the sapwood and one needs to keep practicing our sutta meditations to keep uncovering uh, the truth and uh, following the good example of the Buddha and the Noble Arahants and making that strong intention not to fall for this, not to fall short and fall for this, but know that it is one good part of the practice that enables you to then realize Nibbana. So the last part of the sutta is really about attaining the perpetual liberation. So really, this is where it's different. This is where you don't fall for gain, honor, and praise. You know that the intention is not fulfilled. You're pleased with the attainment of virtue. You're pleased with the attainment of concentration, uh, but you still know the intention is not fulfilled. You're pleased with knowledge and vision, uh, the, the, the benefit of that but you know that the intention is not fulfilled. And so instead of going into unwholesome states, what happens is you don't uh, disparage others and lord yourself. You don't become intoxicated with knowledge and vision. You don't grow negligent and fall into negligence. Instead, you're vigilant towards the true goal, which is the attainment of perpetual liberation. So it's impossible, the Buddha says, to fall away from this. And so when you look at what the Buddha says in this regard, uh, let's just go back to this. If we look at the Pali word that the Buddha uses for perpetual liberation, he's talking about asamaya vimokkam. So vimokkha translates as liberation or release or some kind of freedom. Samaya, which is uh, translates as time or moment or temporary. So samaya vimokkha means uh, temporary or momentary liberation. So when the Buddha says asamaya vimoka, he's talking about something that is more permanent or perpetual in terms of liberation. The samaya vimoko, the one that is temporary, it means that you've temporarily subdued defilements, but you haven't uprooted those defilements. Those taints are still there. And in the case of asamaya vimoka, you have the knowledge and vision that enables you to do that, that the roots of the defilements have completely been cut off, destroyed. And so that's why you will not fall from that kind of liberation. So when we look at the simile of the heartwood, it's completely different. One needs heartwood, seeks heartwood, wanders in search of heartwood, comes to the great tree and sees that uh, possessed of heartwood, cutting off only its heartwood, that's all he takes away knowing that it's hardwood. So the wise person that sees this happening says that person hasn't fall, fallen for the twigs and leaves, the outer bark, the inner bark, the sapwood. They've found the heartwood and they've taken away 
taken it away, knowing that their purpose will be served. So likewise, when we practice this spiritual life, when we seek out the final goal, the true goal of Nibbana, then it's impossible for us to fall away. We have found the heart word. So that is our, our true goal of spiritual life. And so we come back to this slide again, the closing statement that, you know, this spiritual life is not for gain, honor, and praise, you know, as its benefit. It's not for the attainment of virtue as its benefit. It's not for the attainment of concentration for its benefit or for knowledge and vision for its benefit. It is this unshakable deliverance of mind that is the true goal of spiritual life, its heartward and its end. And so the, the word that the Buddha uses here is akupa cheto vimukti. So akupa being unshakable or steadfast and cheto vimukti is liberation of mind or emancipation of mind. And so you don't fall away from that. And so you can see at each turn, when you look on the right-hand side, these benefits, they are part of the spiritual life and definitely part of the training in the spiritual life. But when you get to each stage, you don't fall for it thinking that this is it or fall for the sukkah of it or glorify it or make a sense of self out of it. You know that the final goal, the true goal is this unshakable deliverance of mind. Akupa cheto vimukti. So when you really look at that, it's, it's a very beautiful teaching because there is both an encouragement and a warning embedded into this teaching, an encouragement towards spiritual progress on the path and confirming all the elements to that progress, but at the same time, warning not to be like Devadatta, not to be like uh, any of the people that start to cultivate unwholesome states and, and not to fear it, but to work with it, that this is also part of our gradual training, that part of it is like checks and balances. We look at our checks and balances as we go through, because sometimes in different nefarious or insidious ways, something comes to steer us off course or to challenge us. And what we need to do is rise up to the challenge by looking at these insight pathways that the Buddha gives us. They're like our checks and balances to make sure that we stay steady. We stay on the right path. We don't veer off. We don't fall. We don't decline or we don't stagnate. And it's very, very helpful. So we can end with the, uh, this Dhammapada verse. And this is encouragement from the Buddha to... Uh, these monks and it's really interesting because uh, what these monks had already attained is very much what is in the Maha Saropama Sutta so the Dhammapada commentary to verses 271 and 272 the Buddha's residing at Jetavana monastery and he he utters this, these verses in reference to these monks who become complacent in their spiritual practice so they've fallen short of the heartwood and what the bhikkhus were endowed with was virtue. So they had the attainment of virtue. And some of them were doing dutanka practices. So they strictly observed some austere practices, uh, a bit like Venerable Mahakasapa. And some had wide wisdom. So if you remember, this is putupanyo. So when you listen to the Dhamma, sometimes some people can uh, have the wide wisdom of being able to um, remember what they've heard, uh, when the they've been taught, they recognize the good Dhamma in the beginning, the middle, and the end, and they have very good intentions towards the Dhamma. Their mind doesn't get divided, and they retain what they hear. And so then they can practice in accordance with the teaching. So these bhikkhus had even had that. And they also could achieve the higher concentration, the jhanas, and, and, and higher states of subtle, subtle subtleness of mind. And some of them had already attained the fruit of non-returning. So some of them were already anagamis and so on. So they thought that since they had achieved that much, that it would be very easy for them to attain the fruit of arahanship. So they became complacent. And so with that thought, they went to see the Buddha. And the Buddha asked them, because have you attained the fruit of arahanship? 
And they replied that they were in that kind of condition. They had virtue. They, they did the Tanga practices. They had the wide wisdom. They could, uh, you know, realize the higher concentration and also maybe even the fruit of their practice. They mentioned to the Buddha and the Buddha, of course, could probably see all that. And uh, what they also said to the Buddha was that it wouldn't be difficult for them to attain arahantship, the fruit of arahantship. And the Buddha said to them, because just because you are endowed with virtue, just because you've attained the fruit of non-returning, you should not be complacent and think that there is just a little more to be done. Unless you have eradicated all the taints, so this is the Arthavas, you must not think that you have realized perfect bliss of arahant fruition. And so he utters, not by virtue and observances, nor by great learning, nor by attaining concentration, nor by dwelling secluded, nor by touching the happiness of renunciation, not practiced by ordinary worldlings. A bhikkhu cannot be confident if they have not attained the destruction of intoxicants of the mind. So the asavas. So this is very much directed at monks. But of course, we can always get encouragement from the Buddha's words, even as lay people, because sometimes what happens is we do get complacent. If we're honest, there are times that when we think, oh, you know, when I do these sutta meditations, I can get to pretty good, you know, mental absorption. Uh, my, my sila is good. Um, I'm, I'm learning a lot of Dhamma and I can remember it. Uh, on and on like that. We do also get complacent. And so when we see that and we heed the Buddha's words in this respect, despite it being directed at monks, we can also take encouragement from it because when we have relative safety, the Buddha is still encouraging, you know, whether you're a stream enterer or closer to it or whether you have other fruits of the path, then the Buddha encourages, don't stop. And we know that this precious human life is, is very short. You know, our lifespan is very short and we don't know with our next breath, the next moment when death is coming. And so it's very important to keep our eye on the true goal and do our, do our best within our, within our capacity, within our means, within our, our uh, set of conditions. And so I think this is a very nice way to end uh, I'll look at the Mahasaropama Sutta with this encouragement from the Buddha not to be complacent and, and to think of it that way.